Welcome to the MedCast Plus Show. I am your host, Dr. Jack Braha. Here on the MedCast Plus Show, we will bring you relevant healthcare topics to discuss with local healthcare providers, experts in their field. These physicians who work locally here in our area will help shed light on various health topics that the public, the viewers like you, are interested in. I have the honor today of welcoming Dr. Mitchell Lipton. He is a local internist and cardiologist, double board certified in his fields, who has been practicing medicine for over 40 years. Dr. Lipton, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Tell me about your practice. Where are you in Brooklyn? I'm in the Marine Park area on Quentin Road, and it's, a, it's very easy to get to from many different uh, areas. Uh, I practice predominantly cardiology, because most of the patients who have diabetes and high blood pressure w either have cardiological problems or will have them if not being treated. And you see patients both in the office setting as well as in the hospital for emergencies? I see my patients in the office, and every morning I go to the hospital beforehand to see those patients who have been admitted to the hospital. So tell me about your practice. How long have you been there? I've been in this location for 15 years. I was in the Georgetown area prior to that for 11 years, and prior to that on Flatbush Avenue near Avenue U for another 10 years. So you've had decades of experience here in Brooklyn. You know the Brooklyn patient. Did you do some of your training here in Brooklyn? I trained at Brookdale Hospital for five years before I opened my practice in 1982. So what is the course of education to become a cardiologist like you? How long are you going to be in school? How long is the training after? It seems like it was forever, and it never really ends. After college and medical school, there's internship, residency, and a specialty fellowship, which I did in cardiology. But our, our education never stops. We're always taking uh, continuing medical education courses, and we either give or see lectures by various experts in the field. And, th and that's a very important point that you bring up for our viewers today and, and patients out there, is to be sure your doctor is keeping up with ongoing education, keeping up with board certifications. H how do you feel about that? I think it's very important, as long as we don't get overregulated and spend more time preparing to do things instead of seeing the patients. Patients come first. Always. So for the patients watching today who are interested in cardiovascular health, which is really diseases of the heart and the arteries and the veins, what are some of the signs or symptoms that somebody may be suffering from heart disease? Some of the signs um, are new onset of something that just doesn't feel right. Very often in men, it's quite typical, exertional chest discomfort, tightness, shortness of breath, Sometimes you may get dizzy spells or have tingling in a limb or actual pain in a limb when you exert yourself. And some of these topics or some of these signs that you brought up, th these are signs of a heart attack, that someone could be having a injury to the heart from an artery being blocked, correct? It's not commonly a sign of a heart attack unless it lasts more than a, f more than a few minutes. People you generally will have s uh, signs and symptoms of coronary artery disease before they ever have their heart attack. And this hopefully will get them to a doctor to start treatment to reduce the risk of having a heart attack. So this is very important here. So what we're saying is there may be some warning signs even before a heart attack that should bring someone into the doctor. That's correct. The first episode of chest pain, which is a heart attack, is probably in less than 25% of the population. So the majority of folks who start to develop discomfort in their chest or some cardiac type symptoms, they're not having a heart attack, but these are warning signs. That's correct. Okay. So if patients come into your office, what are some of the first things that you go over with them in terms of their lifestyle, whether it be diet, exercise, family history, how do you identify patients who are at a high risk? Well, when we see a patient for the first time, we explore their complete history from medical problems to surgeries to family health 
to um, their social activities such as smoking or drinking heavily. And we do a whole battery of blood tests, EKGs, and other tests as necessary to define the presence of heart disease already or the fact that we have to work hard to prevent the smaller problems from beginning, begetting heart attacks. So how much of a role does diet, smoking, drinking, lack of exercise, these factors that we call lifestyle factors, how big of a role do they play in the development of heart disease? At least 50% of the risk is so-called man-made. The rest is genetics. So when we say man-made, does that mean our dinner that we made? That's correct. Does that mean our lunches, our drinks? Our smoking history. What can one do very easily off the bat if we have a young patient watching today who does not have any heart disease at this time? What can they do very easily at home? What are some simple steps that folks can take to prevent the development of heart disease? Regular exercise has been shown to be very, very helpful, not only reducing heart disease, but also reducing high blood pressure and diabetes, which will lead to heart disease down the road. In addition, staying away from obvious problems such as smoking, mm -hmm. overeating, and a very important thing is good dental health. The, heart, the mouth is the gateway to your heart, both from a dietary point of view and also from uh, a problem with your gums, which, which causes inflammation. So that, that's a very interesting point that many of the folks watching today may not know. Dent, dental evaluations, going to the dentist, uh, can be a part of cardiac workup or cardiac predictions of a heart attack in the future? That's quite correct. When I see a patient who has evidence in the blood of excess um, inflammation, depending on how high the levels are, I will very frequently refer them to a periodontist to look at their gums and make sure that they don't have gingivitis. So the two are connected. Very Dental connected. health and cardiac health, that, that's incredible. Moving on from diet to exercise, what is considered adequate exercise to help prevent cardiac disease? Or if someone already has cardiac disease, what is adequate exercise to help prevent future problems for them? Well, for people who don't yet have cardiovascular disease and limitations on what they can do, um, approximately 25 minutes of significant exercise for f at least four days a week. So when we say significant exercise, are we talking the walk in the morning to the train or the walk home after? Uh, what is significant exercise? Um, when you're starting out, walking is great. As you build up stamina, you should expand um, your horizons by walking faster or going to the gym and actually doing things. As we get older, and we do have risk factors, it is very important that your doctor go over symptoms that you might have on a treadmill or on um, an exercise bicycle, what to look for to avoid s symptoms getting worse while you're on these modalities. So as, and when people have defined heart problems already, they may not be able to exercise as heavily. So you have to tailor an educational, uh, in an educational way, the do's and don'ts and give them exercise that will not overtax their system. For patients watching today, if they've had a history of heart disease or they may have some symptoms of heart disease, they shouldn't just go jump on a, tread, a treadmill tomorrow, see their doctor first is what, is what I'm hearing. That's correct. For a young patient, 30 years old, in good health, four days a week, 25 minutes a day of strenuous cardiovascular exercise, getting the heart rate up is what's recommended. That's correct. And we, to get the heart rate up, there are various um, equations of maximal heart rate and percentages thereof that you want to aim for. For instance, uh, you take 220, subtract your age, and you want to get to at least 80% of that number. So a 30-year-old would want to get to 80% of 190, which is pretty, pretty heavy workout. 
and sustain this for and 25 sustain, minutes. And sustain this for 25 minutes. Of course, the first day you do it, you're not going to start running fast. You have to build up your stamina and avoid injuring yourself both uh, from an orthopedic point of view right. and from a cardiovascular and in point my, of view. And in my practice in, in gastroenterology, we deal with fatty liver disease, which is part of the metabolic syndrome consisting of heart disease, cholesterol, blood pressure. And I explain to patients the same thing. Start off slowly, head into the gym. Is there a type of exercise that you like better, where, whether it's rowing or the elliptical machine or treadmill? What, what do you suggest to your patients? Uh, it depends on whether the patients have um, arthritis or are very overweight. The ones who have arthritis or the risk of having arthritis because of excess weight who are somewhat older than the young 30-year-old studs should start off easy and avoid high impact, such as bicycling is better, elliptical is better, treadmill can be tough on patients who are overweight because of if they don't have arthritis that they can feel, they probably still have arthritis that they that will get worse with high impact because sports. of the impact on the treadmill. That's correct. So we've talked about some diet changes. We've talked about lifestyle changes in the gym to exercise. But what happens now when someone walks into your office, has a history of suspected heart disease or already established heart disease? We hear a lot about aspirin. We see it on TV. There are commercials that are advertising aspirin as a needed supplement or medication. Who should be taking aspirin? OK, patients who are considered to be moderate to high risk for heart disease or vascular disease in general should be taking a baby aspirin, 81 milligram low dose aspirin on a daily basis, unless they've already had a problem of, of stomach bleeding. So aspirin indicated for those who have risk factors or who already have disease. What about these drugs we hear about called statins? Medications that can lower cholesterol. Who should be taking a medication called a statin? It depends on your age and your family history and your level of cholesterol. There have been many um, publications that give guidelines. And invariably, these guidelines, when published, are usually three years behind because it takes so long for them to make the guidelines. So you have to figure out what the risk is for the patient. Now, it's not just the level of cholesterol or the, or the low density uh, LDL cholesterol. Um, it's also the whole picture of the patient. There are other factors such as level of inflammation. For instance, patients who have inflammatory disease such as rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis have a much higher incidence of cardiovascular disease because of the inflammation. These are the people who must get started at the time they are first diagnosed to really control their cholesterol. In addition to lowering cholesterol, statins also have the effect of lowering this level of um, risk based on the inflammation. So what you're saying here is that even if someone doesn't have primary heart disease, that the, the problem could be outside of the area of the heart. If they have other diseases, the body is, as we know, well-connected. Inflammation in one area, such as an arthritis, may be affecting the heart. Well, it's very indirect. People who have a high level of inflammation, for, it depends on the type of arthritis. Uh, degenerative joint disease doesn't give as much inflammation as rheumatoid arthritis. In fact, they did a study comparing patients who were on standard therapy for rheumatoid arthritis versus those who were given one of these new biologicals, and they found a 50% reduction in heart attacks in patients who took the new biological as compared to the old standard of methotrexate. So here's an example of treating a disease that is not directly related to the heart. Improving that disease has beneficial effects on the heart, which brings us full circle to diet, lifestyle, treating the whole body and improving our health in, in all aspects really can help reduce the risk of heart disease and heart attacks is what I'm hearing here. And that is quite correct. Now, Getting back to um, lifestyles, patients who are overweight or even worse, obese or morbidly obese, are more prone to get high blood pressure and diabetes. Mm -hmm. 
But in addition, because of the fat cells in our abdominal area, which, um, which are very bad, and I'll explain that in a minute, these patients have to lower the weight so that these fat cells do not fill with fat. Once they fill with fat, they secrete a lot of inflammatory proteins, which contribute to the apple and pear bo body look into having higher incidence of cardiovascular disease. And you talk about the apple and pear. Where is the dangerous fat? We hear this on the news. We read about it. There is fat that is considered more dangerous than other. Tell me where this is. Belly fat is the worst area. These fat cells are, are the cells that start when we're young, turning baby fat into regular fat. By the time we're three years old, the number of fat cells in our belly have been formed and they don't get larger or smaller. They just fill with fat more or less. So there's a new um, procedure which actually freezes these cells and rids people of those fat cells. Of course, it's not going to help weight loss if you don't change your diet. Other fat cells outside that, the body will fill with fat, but they're not as dangerous as the fat cells in the belly. Now, do we have data yet? Is there research yet that shows that freezing these fat cells down in the belly reduces the risk of future heart attacks, or are we still waiting to see? I don't even know if it's being studied, but it should be if it isn't. But just on a theoretical basis, since we know the inflammatory problems related to belly fat cells will be taken away. Whether it has an impact on, on long-term uh, outlooks in cardiovascular disease it has not been proven. So if a viewer out there today is watching us talk about this freezing of the fat cells and the belly fat, the first steps that they really should be taking is diet and exercise focused on reducing the size of their waist? That's correct. So reducing the size of the waist is the goal. That is where we're going to see a reduction in cardiac risk. Correct. And you might want to know that people do not get fat from eating fats. Um, they get fat from eating carbohydrates because it establishes a pattern of over-secretion of insulin, which causes a metabolic syndrome. It makes people retain uh, their calories instead of metabolizing them and it's stored for the future. So this brings us to back to diet a bit. And it, it reminds me of studies and, and what we were taught back in the 70s and in the 80s, that we should be on a low fat diet. And that was what was pushed for many years, for decades, that Americans need to focus on a low fat diet. But we ended up changing to a low fat diet and increasing our carb intake, our carbohydrates. So did we get it wrong for all these years? Was, were we told to eat the wrong things back in the 70s and 80s? Yes, we were. And it was obvious to certain people based in the mid 80s that everything was going wrong from a metabolic point of view in patients who cut their fat and ate lots of carbohydrates. And that's all about insulin. So after changing their diet, exercising, they come to Dr. Lipton, they come to see you in the office. They're worried they could have heart disease. Tell me about these tests. What is an EKG? An EKG means electro, electrocardiogram. It, it can be also called an ECG. But because it was originally invented in Germany, the cardiogram was, had a K in it. And the EKG gets done, you review it, right. things e look okay. EKG is basically the electrical activity uh, of the heart showing the direction of electric, electrical flow, which can give us a, um, an answer to whether or not there's an abnormality in, in the heart muscle or the, primarily in the electrical system. So you can see what we call an arrhythmia, abnormal beating of the heart. You could even tell if, if a heart attack has gone on or is, is actually happening right now. That's correct. We can see the electricity of, a, of an old heart attack or one that's happening at the moment. So you move on from the EKG and, and you tell the patient, you need a stress test. Explain to us what that means, a stress test. Okay, a lot of patients may not have any symptoms because they don't lead a life of exercise. So you want to stress their system to see if 
a, a workload will promote the signs or symptoms that mean that an artery is partially or nearly completely blocked. Now, I went for a stress test once, and they put me on a treadmill, and they attached me to uh, 100 different wires. How does that work? It's quite simple. We watch the EKG and see if a certain portion of the EKG changes during exercise. Now, there are superior ways of doing stress testing now with nuclear imaging or what we call stress echocardiography because the electrical activity of the heart changes well after the blood flow to the heart muscle has been compromised. So doing nuclear testing um, where a radioactive material is given to the patient um, will show us how much radioactivity is taken up by the heart muscle, which is dependent on blood flow to that heart muscle. Now, based on these results, if you see a problem while someone's exercising, their EKG changes or these pictures you're talking about, they show changes. What is the next step? Well, the next step is if the changes are very severe on the EKG, we may not finish the test and wait for the nuclear study. We'll just tell the patient, this is really so bad that we're not, we don't want to waste time. We're sending you to the hospital because we're going to arrange for you to have a coronary angiogram. Other times, the change on the EKG are rather, rather small and non-diagnostic, yet the perfusion that's seen on the nuclear stress portion will give us the clue that there's poor flow to the heart muscle. And then we collectively can do the angiogram. And so you mentioned this word angiogram. So for folks watching at home who may not know what this is, break that down for us. Make it very simple. Angio means artery. So you're studying the arteries by injecting a contrast medium, or a dye, it's called, that will outline the artery, and you can see how much and to what degree these arteries are blocked up by cholesterol plaque. And at this point, when we find these blockages or these narrowings, we, we call the plumber in. We call the, the interventional cardiologist who is a different type of cardiologist, correct? Right. The interventional cardiologist um, will do the angiogram, and if the artery is blocked and reaches certain guidelines of pressure differences between the two sides of the blockages, then um, they will put a stent in. A stent is basically a metal fiber straw that slips over the area where the blockage was. Now, how does it do this if the blockage is there? What they do is they inflate a balloon on the end of a catheter, and they actually crush the plaque with the high carbon dioxide pressure on, on the plaque so that there's no longer a narrowing. And the stent and will sit there. Sit there and keep it there. Incredible. Way. Incredible. So you can give somebody almost new life by opening up this blocked artery. That's correct. Now, in certain situations, there's this culprit artery, and they will fix that right away. And we're back to the non-interventional diagnostic clini clinical cardiologist that I am to follow up and try to prevent progression of this disease. So we talked about preventing getting to this point. So now we have a patient who, say, came to your office with some symptoms. You did a stress test. You did an EKG. You sent them right over for an angiogram. They had a stent put in. What do we do next? How do we prevent the next event for them? Okay, I'm going to tell you about drugs and lifestyle. Lifestyle is the same as if you were at risk, but now you're no longer at risk. You're at risk of actually getting things worse. You have established cardiovascular disease. So the first thing we do is try to get the patient's cholesterol, specifically the LDL cholesterol, to a value of under 70. Uh, you may not know these numbers, but you probably have heard it somewhere that the cholesterol has to be lower than a certain amount. Now, this has been the threshold for many, many years for patients who have established vascular disease in any arterial bed bed in the body. Meaning their legs, their arms, if they have vascular disease, problems with their arteries. In any part in of any the part, body. This is the it, goal. It could be in the neck, mm -hmm. it could be in the smaller cerebral brain arteries. Magic number 70. Num number 70. But that is no longer 
the magic number. For patients who, ha who have not been able to get to goal because they cannot tolerate the statins mm. or other drugs to lower it to 70, there is new medication that is injectable on an every two week or four week basis, which will lower the cholesterol even further. And recent studies have shown that over and above the statin in patients who have not yet gotten to, to goal of less than 70, we can reduce further cardiovascular events by up to 25%. So there is some magic out there. So for folks watching today, we, we talked about preventing the first event, signs of the first event, and there's even help after if someone actually ends up with heart disease to treat them. I want to thank you all for watching today. Thank you for your interest in our show and for watching MedCast Plus. We hope that with the experts we bring here on our show, we can help educate the public about their health, prevent disease, and if you have any suggestions or want to become involved, please contact us on our website, www.medcastplus.com. I'm your host, Dr. Jack Braha. Thank you for watching. We look forward to seeing you again soon.